talk I've wanted to give for a long time, and it's maybe more for me than for you. Um, <laughs> I'm a product manager, which means I have to put a safe harbor statement up. That's not really going to apply. Um, I am also going to be very honest. Uh, because this is a sponsored talk, we will have a word from our sponsors. Um, however, 50% of my slides are about Oracle and Hadoop, and 50% of the slides are about comic books. However, since we're doing a demo, there's a lot more comics than there is Oracle. Um, so it's a vendor talk. Like I said, we've got to have a word from our sponsors. And certainly, I think, you know, this has been the case for several years now. You see Oracle with a booth at a big data convention. It's like, does Oracle really use Hadoop? Really, guys? Yes, we actually really use Hadoop. Um, we use more and more of it as time goes on, in fact. Um, do we build anything using Hadoop? Yes. Also, yes. And increasingly, more and more of our products are tightly integrated with and, in fact, leverage the broader big data ecosystem. OK, OK, fine. So we use Hadoop. We build stuff on Hadoop. But does anybody like, actually call up Oracle and say, like, hey, guys, we're going to do this you know, Hadoop thing. Are you going to help us out? Actually, yes. Um, so do we really use Hadoop? Yes, Oracle uses Hadoop in part to process logs, logs coming off of our engineered systems, for example. Anytime one of our big boxes breaks down in the field, it fires off an automatic service request. That service request goes into a Hadoop cluster where a team actually sits and uses MapReduce, Pig, and now Spark to go over that and try and figure out how to do predictive analysis about batch failures. So if we got a bad batch of drives from Toshiba, we'd like to be able to proactively replace those. Uh, generally speaking, this group's aim is to minimize downtime for our customers going forward. Uh, we build on it, as I mentioned. So one product that you can actually see featured at our booth is something called Big Data Discovery. This is, they like to call it the visual face of Hadoop. And it is very, very pretty. Um, it's a way to actually say you have a bunch of data in H catalog. And you really want to know how that data correlates with, its, you know, with other data sets. You want to know what the distributions of things are. You want to see how can things be enriched or geotagged or otherwise marked up. And this makes it very, very simple for a business analyst to do that. However, the back end is all Apache Spark. Uh, our Oracle Data Integrator product um, is, in fact, very big data friendly. It's a, it's a code generation and templating tool. So you can define complex ETL pipelines using nice WYSIWYG components. And then you can choose how you want that instantiated. You can have that instantiate in a database. You can have that instantiate as a Spark job. You can have that instantiate as a pig job. You can register it with Uzi and have it run all day long. Um, and then coming out of my group, uh, we actually have a technology called Oracle Big Data SQL. Um, a number of vendors are beginning to move this direction, but for us, this is an ability to say you can now write Oracle SQL across NoSQL databases, both our own and systems like HBase and MongoDB, HDFS, including any number of input formats you can think of, and Oracle database. So one query that's going to span all of your data stores. Um, it's useful if you're trying to sell large organizations on adopting Hadoop, because they can actually continue to run their business, but at the same time start to see real cost analysis, cost benefits from using Hadoop. OK, fine. That's, that's great. You have some products. But is anybody buying this stuff? Is anybody using this stuff? Yes, just very briefly. Um, Spain's largest bank uh, uses Oracle's big data solutions extensively, um, largely in the area of mainframe downsizing. Being a big enterprise, we see a lot of other big enterprises that have mainframes that are 30 or 40 years old. And, and they're trying to get rid of those. Um, they're also trying to modernize their data models. When you're, when you're largely locked into mainframe-based uh, databases for reporting, your data models may not be as flexible as you'd like for real 360 analysis. West Africa's largest telephone company. That's, a, that's kind of a weird one. Like Whoever talks about Africa and Silicon Valley um, without talking about saving the world, we're not saving the world. Um, what we're doing is saving 35,000 call minutes per day. Um, this is allowing uh, Globocom, uh, Globocom uh, the ability to actually analyze their network traffic across West Africa 40 times faster. Um, and the world's largest and most profitable CPG company, Procter & Gamble, um, does a lot of stuff with Hadoop, does a lot of stuff with Hadoop on various Oracle solutions. Um, it allows them to do a number of things, upstream research, manufacturing and supply chain analysis. And really, for P&G, a lot of it has been that they're able to get insights faster. And I think that's a story you hear a lot when you come to Summit, is that you know, people actually do find answers more quickly. They become more agile when they adopt big data technologies. So yes, yes, and yes. We do use Hadoop. We do build on Hadoop. And we do actually partner with people to help them find value in Hadoop. 
Now let's talk about comic books. <laughs> All right, so here's the question to everybody who's in the audience. Who is the most important Marvel hero? There are lots of ways that we can answer that. There are answers from aggregation. Right? Who has the most appearances overall out of all Marvel books? Who has the most series? How many, how many individual Spider-Man universes are there? And does that make him more important? Um, who has the most movie appearances? Who has the most toys? Um, certainly, we would say maybe the Avengers are maybe more important than they used to be. I don't know. Um, these are tabular questions. And these are well suited to tools like SQL. These are well suited to a lot of the data processing that we talk about lately when we talk about Hadoop. However, a lot of my background is actually in graph analysis. And I'm very interested in answers from connectivity. Right? So when I talk about answers from connectivity, who's the most central to teams? Who has the strongest kind of crossovers with other series and universes? How, is, how important is a hero to his or her own community? And these are interesting business questions when we talk about our customers. And they are predominantly graph questions. And while there have been attempts made over the years to retrofit tools like SQL, or you know, languages like SQL or tools like RDBMSs to deal with graph information, we generally need something different. So this is the only reason I actually get to give this talk about comic books. Uh, we actually went out and built a thing for this. And I'm shocked that they let us build this. Um, it's called Oracle Big Data Graph. And what it is is it's a massively scalable graph database. It runs on Apache HBase or our own NoSQL database. And it scales to trillions of edges. So we benchmark this thing in HBase against trillion, multi-trillion edge data sets. Uh, it's also available for developers to try out without having to pay a fee, which is shocking. Um, so it comes not only with this massively distributed graph store, but then also a layer of in-memory graph analytics that you can either deploy on Yarn on a standalone server or embed into a Java process. Now, this allows us to do more than 30 graph analysis algorithms just like that and with a single call. And we have a lot of simple interfaces, none of which odd, oddly are SQL. So we have a Java interface. We support the Tinkerpop Blueprint standard because it's a very good property graph interface. Uh, we have a Groovy shell. We have Groovy, uh, Groovy libraries for it as well. And then we have a Python interface. So we're going to be using that tool to actually talk about comics. But the question be becomes, how do superheroes become a graph? Right? So for those of you who know about graphs, this is probably rudimentary. But for those of you who don't, let's talk about it. Each hero is a vertex. Right? So in my terminology, each hero is a vertex. If I talk about the original Avengers, each one of these heroes is, <clears throat> in fact, going to be a little circle. Right? So if we take the original Avengers from 1963, the team was Thor, Iron Man, Hulk, Ant-Man, and Wasp. Now, I don't know why there were two shrinking bug people in the original Avengers, but there were. Now, when those team members assemble and become the Avengers, everyone is connected to everyone else. Right? So we call this kind of graph fully connected. Now, in a much larger graph, they would be a click. Now, something happens. right? So a few episodes in, I think 15 or so issues in, uh, the Hulk leaves, and they find Captain America buried in the ice. And Captain America joins the team. Well, so now Captain America is connected to Iron Man, and he's connected to Thor, and he's connected to Ant-Man, and he's connected to Wasp, but he's not connected to Hulk. And so at this point, the graph is no longer fully connected. And if you start adding characters from the Marvel Universe into the overall series run of the Avengers, the graph that results gets kind of complex. So now let's switch over, and we'll go and look at a demo. Or st we'll start our demo, effectively. So, I'm using my Python notebook and the Python API we wrote for this stuff. And I've already connected to my database. And I'm running it on Oracle's NoSQL database because it's a little lighter as a process in a VM than HBase is. Anyway, I've connected to it. And this is the graph we're going to look at. Right? So I have 6,426 characters connected 224,176 ways. So it's a lot of different interconnections. Now, all of the data for this, just because I need, to, I need to be proper in my attribution, actually comes from Marvel.com's API. You can actually go pull this stuff yourself. It's been used in research before. And it's a very good approximation for actual social systems. So in terms of using this, I'm just going to talk to it like I talk to anything else in IPython Notebook. I'm going to grab the tools I usually like to use. And then let's say I want to go get a, a vertex out of this. I want to get a hero. 
So all I do is say, get me the minimum ID, uh, then go get that vertex with that minimum ID, and then print it out for me. And so this person's in a community, they have a name, and it's the second version of ASP, who was named Cleo. I don't actually know who that is. I, I'm not that good with comics. So let's go back to the slide, and we'll talk a little bit about the analyses that we're going to perform. Now we're, oh, wait, no, we were back to the slides. I couldn't tell because they looked just like my demo. <laughs> OK, so the question for anybody who doesn't care about comics, and if you don't care about comics, why are you in this room, um, is are your customers any different from superheroes? I think anybody in a marketing role would probably say that, oh, of course our customers are heroes. Um, but so again, here's the question to the audience. Who is the most important Marvel hero? Hands up for Captain America. OK. Hands up for Iron Man. OK. Hands up for Spidey. All right, all right, get some Spidey support in the back. Hands up for Wolverine. OK, I see you, bub. All right, so let's go find out. Let's go back to the, uh, let's actually talk about how we're going to figure this out first. So I mentioned we're talking about answers from connectivity. And there are lots of different ways in a graph system we might think of importance. So we could think of importance as something called degree centrality. Right? So we've already talked about the fact that our heroes are, in fact, vertices. And their appearances together count as edges. Right? So the more edges a vertex has, the higher its degree. The greater the degree, the more important the vertex is. And this is a way that we can actually look at importance. So you know, the question you might ask yourself if you're not interested in comic books and care about marketing is, is your most connected customer your most important customer? Now let's go back to the demo and figure it out. So the way I'm going to go about doing this is I'm going to go and launch our in-memory analyst. Right? So this is a little analyst interface that spins up our, our property graph analysis engine. It loads up. By the way, if it errors out, it's all on me because I actually wrote this interface. <laughs> Wait for the little asterisk to go away. There we go. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at in-degree centrality. And I'm going to go ahead and get the top 15 in-degree centrality nodes from this. All right, that didn't take very long. So I'm going to map this into a pandas data frame, and then I'm going to do a plot. All right, so just map it into a data frame, nice and easy. I write nasty, ugly lambda functions, so just excuse that. So then I go and I plot this. And now we're going to scroll down, and we're going to see the results. Oh, Captain America by a mile. So you guys up front, largely right. Largely right. However, let's go back to the slides, and we'll talk about it a little bit more. So I'm going to ask you again, based on the results we just had, who is the most important Marvel superhero? Is it Captain America? Come on, we just saw the results, guys. Is it Captain America? Nobody thinks it's Cap, even though we just showed it was Cap. OK, is it Iron Man? No? One guy for Iron Man. Is it Spider-Man? Spidey supporters still hold the strong in the back. All right. Is it, is it Wolverine? All right, he still likes Wolverine. All right, good for him. Let's go look at it a different way. We're going to look at it through Importance's page rank. So, the notion in PageRank and similar algorithms is that importance flows through a graph. And by doing a series of random walks, we can begin to see how importance actually collects at various nodes and how they influence each other. So a node becomes important if it's also connected to by important nodes. So in the case of Iron Man, if Rocket Racer connects to him, OK, who's Rocket Racer? He's the, skate, he's the, the skating guy, right? It's kind of annoying. Um, However, if Captain America connects to Iron Man, Iron Man's actually much more important. And so this is a measure of trust. Obviously, this is how Google began to actually be, look at, at how trusted sites were. It's a, it's a notion of prominence. And the point I'm trying to make here is that thinking about customers or individuals or systems in a graph requires that we understand that there are many different ways that we can define importance. So let's go back to our demo and look at it a different way. So this time, I'm just going to ask the analyst to give me the top 15 page ranks. And that just takes a little bit of time. And now we're going to plot this. 
And as we scroll down, we'll find that the answer is now, in fact, Spidey. So for those of you in the back holding strong, also right. And the point is also right, not one is and one is not. There are many ways we can actually consider importance when we think about graphs. Let's go back to the slides and we'll move on a little bit. So this is a slide I've wanted to make for years. Who the heck is Moon Knight? Does anybody in this room know who Moon Knight is? All right, right on, a couple of people do know. For the rest of you who are looking at me like, why is this guy so interested in Moon Knight? So he's like Batman, but he wears white and he's dead. Um, <laughs> I know, it's crazy, but it, Warren Ellis did a great run on Moon Knight that if you're interested, you should read. The, the, the point is that I asked you all who Moon Knight was and three of you said you knew, and the rest of you are like, what? So importance doesn't have to be a global property. Most customers for most enterprises, for most businesses, are actually a little bit like Moon Knight. Important to a couple of people, but they tend to get lost behind the Avengers and Galactus is really tall and, you know, it's, it's hard to see because there's eating of worlds going on. Um, so a question becomes, how do we judge importance relative to a single vertex? How do we think about importance relative to Moonlight? How do we make suggestions based on a single customer? So there are lots of ways that this, this can happen. So personalized page rank is one of the simplest ways that this works. And in this case, all we do is we influence our random walks such that we teleport specifically through only the vertex we're interested in. And this gives us a localized measure of importance. So if you consider the Avengers and Moon Knight and Vibro and Carbon, right? Vibro and Carbon most of us have never heard of, but they actually appear with Moon Knight quite often. Now, Moon Knight shows up in a lot of the other books as well, but if we think about how the people most often appearing with him are to him, their page ranks will actually increase. So let's go back and think about how this extends. There's a relatively well-known algorithm called Salsa, which is what Twitter uses to compute who, you, who it suggests you follow. It's another one of the algorithms we've implemented. So if we go back to the demo, we'll actually look at Moon Knight a little bit. So I don't need to create that vertex index. I already have it. So let's go and find Moon Knight. So actually, a lot of different moons in here, particularly a couple of different Moon Knights show up. There's a Black Knight. So basically, I have a Lucene index on all of my vertices here that I can search. I can do nice plain text searches on properties. But I'm going to go ahead and get Moon Knight specifically. Mark Spector is Moon Knight. All right, I've got Mark Spector. So now I want to figure out who to follow, right? If I, if, if I want to talk about who is important to Moon Knight, let's figure out who we should follow. Not surprisingly, probably a bunch of people you haven't heard of. Credic, Mole Man, Lady Deathstrike you actually probably have heard of, Wendigo. These are all relatively new to me as well. So I could actually go out and figure out who's going to be interesting out of this list of who to follow if I like Moon Knight books. Let's go back to the slides and we'll talk about something perhaps more important in aggregate uh, than single people. So communities. Communities are really interesting. Communities matter too. And comic books are a great place for us to see how communities actually are made manifest. The Avengers you can think of as a community. The X-Men you can think of as a community. And when we think about a community, they're just special subgraphs, right? So a community is a subgraph in which nodes are more connected to each other than they are to the outside world. They're still connected, but they're not connected as, as frequently or with as high a weight externally. And communities prov provoke a lot of really interesting questions. How many communities do you have in the graph of your world? How large are those communities? How do those communities relate to each other? Are there connectors, individual heroes that actually bridge the gap between communities? Are there people who exist only really within a community and don't have broader uh, relation to the outside world? So community analysis is a whole field of research, and there are a number of really interesting algorithms for doing this. But once we've identified community, the neat thing is any of the algorithms we've talked about, any of the measures of importance can be applied to that subgraph as well. So the question a marketer might ask is, who is the most valuable customer in a community? The thing I'm interested in, in fact, is let's go look at some communities. So let's go back to the demo. I apologize to the AV guy because I'm making him run all over the place. So I'm just get, gonna get some communities. And so we're gonna use a method called label propagation, which is one of the fastest ways to go and do this. Maybe not the most accurate, it's not modularity maximization, but it's actually pretty quick. 
So I'm going to go get some communities, and then I'm going to throw them in a data frame and plot them. And so when I plot them, you're going to see something here. First, there's one really big community. And then there's another one that's a little smaller. And then you've got a bunch of these really tiny communities. We might ask ourselves, like, what are these communities? Well, let's say I want to hone in specifically on community zero. Well, if I go and I get another analyst, These guys missed half the good stuff. It's a real shame. So I've got my analyst. And now what I want to do is I'm just going to hone in on community zero. Right? And to do that, I'm basically going to apply a filter to the overall graph and just get the subgraph I'm interested in. I'm simply going to say any, any node who is in community zero I want. And they have to be connected to someone who is in community zero. I don't want any connections to the outside world. So now that I have that, let's go back and we'll do page rank again. I'll shove it in a, in a data frame. We got, hmm, Moon Knight, Mutant, Bloodstorm, Mutant, Brute, Mutant X, Iceman, Mutant X, Scott Summers the third. So off the top of your head, does anybody know what this is? It's Mutant X. It's actually a separate universe. So let's go back to the slides, and we'll talk a little bit about this. So for those of you who don't know what Mutant X is, Mutant X is a book from, I think, the late 90s, early aughts, uh, which is Scott Summers, Scott Cyclops, in a different universe. It's, in fact, Earth-1268, which is part of the reason it's on the title of the talk. So it turns out graph communities, when you look at them for comic books, actually can amount to entire alternate universes, which I think is totally cool. So. That's most of what I had to say about using connectivity to talk about importance. There's a host of other things we could do. There's a host of other things we could go look at. But I wanted to actually bring it back to the, the way most of us produce analytical results on, da on data, which is through tabulated results. And again, we've looked at the fact that finding answers from connectivity may require new tools. It may require that we go off and build a graph database or an in-memory analytics engine or write, write some different kind of wrapper over things. But what I think is very cool is when we start to merge answers from these two domains, it can paint a much rich, richer picture. Right? And that may mean that we're mapping graphs to tables. Well, OK, if we're mapping graphs to tables, that's actually really, really easy. For those of you who know how graphs are typically stored, a graph is often a sparse matrix. Now, a sparse matrix could just be a table of edges and a table of vertices. And so there are lots of different ways that we can represent graphs in ways that are friendly to tabular systems. So let's actually go back and we'll pull in some data from a relational database, blend it with this result from our graph database, and look at what I think is kind of an interesting result. So I'm using the, the really, really awesome IPython SQL um, plugin for IPython. If you guys haven't used this before and you use IPython Notebook, you must put this in right away. Um, so what I have is. So I'm just going to go get Scott Summers out of my community list. And now I'm just going to go to st and go and figure out if this particular Scott Summers appears anywhere else in, you know, in my data set. I have all the comic books that this data set came from stored in a relational database. OK, so this is the Scott Summers that is only in Mutant X. So now I know what book I'm looking for, this MX book. So, now we're going to do a few things to blend this stuff, right? So we're going to go and look at Earth 1268, right? So we're going to get the page rank for, you know, 168, 118 people in there. I'm going to put that in a data frame. And now what I'm going to do is then cross-reference that with the number of appearances for each of these characters. All right, so I'll go and get a data frame from my relational database and then merge that with the names that I actually have in my page rank. And so if I generate a plot of this, what's interesting is I now have the number of appearances on the, the y-axis. And on the, on the x-axis, I have the page rank. And so what I think is really interesting about this is 
when you look at who has the highest page rank versus uh, appearances, it's not actually who you might think. All right, so here's Scott Summers III. He's got a page rank of about 0 0.15, and he's got a lot of appearances, a reasonable number of appearances. He's got about 17 appearances. However, for whatever reason, Iceman in the Mutant X universe has a higher page rank and a much higher appearances count, which is actually probably going to make me go back and look at the Mutant X books and figure out what was up with Iceman. But as we look across, we can sort of see that, you know, you have a number of villains who tend to show up a certain number of times. Magneto shows up a bunch. Elektra shows up, maybe not as a villain. Um, you've got a number of other heroes who sort of appear at the same time, but they're not as important to the universe because they have lower page ranks. So we can say, oh, they appear a reasonable number of times, but they're maybe not as important. So let's go back to the slides. We've got just a couple of minutes to wrap up. And that's what we're going to do is wrap up. So, I don't know, in, in, in my role as a product manager who's slightly analytic, I hear the phrase big data analytics all the time. And it, it's gotten to the point where it, it almost doesn't mean anything to me. Um, but I think what it actually means still, and the, where the, the way in which it's still resonant with me, is that it means that we have to consider blending answers from different paradigms of processing, different paradigms of problem construction, to really find interesting things. And generally speaking, in my brain, that oftentimes is taking answers from aggregation, like who has the most appearances in the mutant X world, and blending them with answers from connectivity, like how important are the members of that particular community. Now, broadly speaking, regardless of how you go to implement this stuff, it's important to think about integration. And if I were to come back and actually circle around to the Oracle story, a lot of what we strive to do is to make the integration of all of these components into larger data ecosystems that have a lot of enterprise technology a lot simpler. But one of the ways that we're trying to do that is by producing new tools that play to the strengths of the Hadoop ecosystem, that use things like HBase and use things like Yarn for resource management. But that said, the point of this talk was really Comic books are cool, graph methods are cool, you should go get some data, you should go get some sort of a graph engine, network action Python's great. Again, you can get this stuff as a developer for free to try out, go do it. Uh, I think it's great. And so with that, thank you, and Q&A if anybody has any. Oh, no questions, all right. <laughs> I hope that was I hope that was fun and a little different than most vendor talks. That was Oh, so the massive one. So what tends to happen in particularly when you look at like the Marvel universe is that the bulk of the primary universe, which is Earth 1 something, I don't remember what it is. 616, that's it. Earth 616 ends up being the biggest community by far. Yeah, so if we, were to, if we were to take just Earth-616 and then go into Earth-616, you would probably find that, say, the X-Men were much, much more of a community than, were, than, than say, the X-Men and the Avengers together, right? So you have to kind of get into more and more decomposed subgraphs to find things like teams. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the one of the interesting things in in community analysis research is hierarchical community analysis. And the way that we would do that with the tools such as tools like this would effectively be to just write a recursion that took a subgraph at each each iteration and went all the way down. Mm, it's a good question. The problem that you end up with in hierarchical community analysis is that the thresholds do, in fact, change. You don't really have an intelligent way to necessarily, say, change your tolerances. Um, the stuff that's available sort of in the research community is a little bit sort of further along than the stuff we would necessarily productize. However, we do have under the covers sort of knobs for all of these sorts of things so that you could actually, you know, define a parameter grid that you wanted to go and use as you recurse to try these things out. And again, a lot of these methods are stochastic, and so you may actually have to run them many, many times to really get what you think is a stable set of communities. Yeah, yeah, you adjust some, yeah, you adjust some knobs on, on the way you sort of treat the distributions and when you converge. And you could, I mean, there are a number of ways we could actually do it. It actually would be a fun thing to go do with this data set, which I might just go home and do. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so particularly when we're, we're talking about sort of like HBase, right? Like the way that table gets laid down, it's easy to pull that information out and you can pull out any property that you want to decorate on an edge or, or a vertex and basically put that in tabular form. And the nice thing, so, so what we've been dealing with is, is called a property graph. And the nice thing about a property graph as opposed to say like an RDF graph is that they're extremely flexible. You effectively have vertices and you have edges and they can have as many properties arbitrarily as they want. It's a very, you can think of it as, as the graph case of schema on read, right? Just a, attach whatever flexible schema you want to stuff and, and analyze it that way. So yeah, if we, wanted to, if we wanted to sort of flatten that graph out and say, give me all the vertices and give me these properties off of them, we just have to go in and decorate our vertices with the right properties. Good questions, thanks. Could we use the microphone, please? What, what, no, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a really common question. What, what about visualization of graphs? Anybody who's tried to visualize complex graphs knows it's tough. You end up with rat's nests all the time, right? Or as we used to call them in the literature, hairballs. Um, part, part, in part because of that. We didn't do anything with visualization in this case. And the other reason that we didn't is that at least within the data management group at Oracle, like we're not very good at visualizing stuff. We're very good at command line tools. Um, popular tools, D3 has a number of nice APIs that you can use to plot nice graphs, but it's a lot of JavaScript to write yourself. Uh, Cytoscape has a, fee, a free viewer that we sometimes plug into this to actually show you a nice graph. But the problem at its heart is when you get too many nodes and edges, you eventually get what looks like a tangled ball of spaghetti. Now, this is where things get very interesting because if you do something like community analysis, you can begin to start to build block models where you say, I'm gonna look at all of Earth 61, I'm gonna look at all of the Marvel Universe. I'm gonna say that, oh look, I did community detection, I found all these universes. Now I'm gonna say each universe is in fact a node, and I can just connect those. That's something that's easy to visualize, because I only have 40 something nodes. Now then, if I wanna go look at Earth 616, I can do community analysis in there. Each team may in fact become nodes. And so these sorts of hierarchical visualizations become important for actually exploring complex graphs. The problem is nobody does a great job off the shelf visualizing that. Um, in terms of, of companies that do a great job of it, Palantir has a real reputation in this space. They're very, very good at it. Can we use the microphone, please? Because the rest of the room cannot hear your question. All right, it's all right, come on up. What software do you recommend to do this hierarchical visualization? <laughs> you know? <laughs> because uh, yes, I mean, uh, that's, uh, that's what people usually do, but uh, there is uh, no software. There's no great tool off the shelf to do it. No, I would say hire a really good JavaScript guy. Um, <laughs> seriously, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. there's no <laughs> great tool for this. Because if you have 300,000 nodes, uh, Gephi doesn't want to. <laughs> no, no to yeah, it. it's true, that's true, right? Because you actually have to go and do this kind of decomposition ahead of time, right? So one of the things you would have to do is go through and do your decomposition, mark your communities, build your block model, and then, after the fact, analyze it. All right, and do you know uh, somebody who do graph search except of uh, LinkedIn and Google? I, so I didn't catch the, the first word, graphs. Uh, well, uh, use uh, uh, community mining uh, to, uh, to advance uh, search. So pretty much everyone does, yes. So LinkedIn does this, Twitter does this, Facebook does this. Um, their implementations may all vary, and they may not all be label prop, right? I mean, some may be mod maximization, some may be, may be you know, other approaches. But you know, if someone is maintaining a social graph in Silicon Valley, they are at least doing some level of community analysis. Everybody came in late. <laughs> you missed all the fun. Um, we got five minutes left. If anybody has any questions, you know, I'm happy to take them, or, or, uh, or you, know, you can get uh, five minutes back in your afternoon. So thanks.